just for everyone on the on the session, a lot of you are aware of uh, Kevin already and um, aware of the great work he does. He's done work for the Genius Bunch, facilitated Clever Bunch, worked with a lot of amazing companies all over planet Earth. You've seen his bio probably on the registration page for this session anyway. Um, those of you that have had the, you know, the, the experience of working with uh, Kevin on different levels, some of you have on, ongoing coaching with Kevin, which is where he really um, helps people transform their businesses. And just as a little side note, kind of transform their lives, to be honest, at the same time. Um, I think uh, Kevin's got a bit of a superpower of not only the business knowledge and skill and marketing and with the numbers side of things, but also, um, you know, a secret little knack of getting people out of their own way <laughs> in a way as well so uh, we're very lucky to have this uh this man with us today and i'm aware of the time and i don't want to take it up so i'm going to hand straight over to you kevin and um and you roll I'll, I'll click my video off and pop myself on mute and um and let you roll with it and check in at the end to see how we go with questions but um just make sure you can oh yeah there we go you got your screen share set up and rocking so over to you Thank you for the uh, thank you for the very beautiful introduction and uh, you said some amazing things about me. But tech is never quite my strong point, so I just want to check that you can see just the slide that says "Stop Leaking Profit." Give me a thumbs yeah. up or a yes. You go yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here today, and I always love uh, being in the Basic Bananas community. It's one of my favorite places to uh, to be, and. Uh, Today, I'm most excited because I'm talking about one of my favorite topics in business, which is profit. I know a lot of people really focus on revenue, and I think really revenue really makes no difference. What makes a difference is profit. And why would I say that? And it's like, really for me, I have children, and I like to take care of my children and make sure that they have great opportunities in life. And I can't do that out of my revenue. I can only do that on my profit. So if you agree that profit is, uh, is a, the most important thing that we end up with in our business, then type a yes for me in the chat box. All right, that's great. Yvonne uh, is on the same page as me, right? And a few hell yeses as well. So that's superb. Um, now, just so I can guide what level of detail I go into on this uh, presentation, I just like to get a feel for where you're at in terms of your gross revenue. So I'd like you to drop into the chat where you are on your annual basis. Are you doing, say, five figures a year, six figures a year, seven figures a year, or uh, eight plus? And you just type in five, six, seven, eight, just on, on where you're at roughly with your annual revenue right now. So a lot of fives, sixes, a heap of sixes. Okay, good. And if there are any eight or nine figure people on here, then that's super cool as well. You're, you're also welcome. Okay, look, this, this helps. So yeah, some sixes, some sevens, brilliant. That's, that's superb. Now, what I want to talk to you uh, more about on this then is where you feel you are in terms of your level of profitability. So if you feel like you're having enough profit right now and is where you want it to be, type in the chat box enough. Or if you feel like you'd be open to making and keeping more profit, type the word more. So either enough or more. A lot of people open for more, 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 more. Okay. All right. So that's the first test pass. We are definitely in the right place with the right people. So that's cool. Now, uh, Camille thinks she has enough, but she's not sure. So we'll look, let's go through this. You may have enough and, and you may find that you get some more as well uh, during this, this conversation. And look, there's really two major leakages in business today, uh, particularly around profit. And we're going to go into a lot of detail, but at a high level, really, a lot of times we are under converting the leads that we get. I know Basic Bananas does an amazing job at helping you know uh, anyone uh, in the community generate more leads, but sometimes we're not doing a great job at converting those. And then once we have those clients, let's say we do convert them, a lot of business owners aren't doing enough to, to service them as in to add uh, you know, more value to help make more um, income from each client. And so today I'm going to talk about how do we turn this around, okay? And really, just so you know a little bit why you listen to me, Crystal gave me a great introduction, but I'm considered as one of the leading profit maximize experts in the world, but definitely in Australia. Uh, over the years, I've had the privilege of working all over the world, and here I am presenting with um, the Basic Bananas community. I know for Crystal, probably four or five years, I got to travel around with you and, and present the, the content everywhere. So I really love the community and, and what you're doing here. Over time as well with some uh, amazing brands and I, here's an example uh being on stage at tony robbins event a few times and i've got to speak at larger stages all around europe australia etc so this this is why uh, i'm going to add a lot of value today what happens is i work with a lot of different clients from a lot of different countries and industries so i get to see the trends and i bring those trends uh to people now the, one of the reasons that these companies have entrusted me is because 
I really take time to look at, you know, what is the five steps of freedom? How do we get business owners to this place where the business is delivering everything that they, they want and they get an income that they want and they're, they're doing as much or as little work in the business. They can choose not to be in the business if they want to. And so um, what I'd like to do is get a feel for where you're at in terms of your journey on this five, uh, five steps of freedom. So creation is where you have just kind of launched. You're still not fully sure on your ideal client. You're maybe not clear on your market or your product. You're still kind of figuring things out. Chaos, you kind of have that down pat. You know who you're targeting, you're servicing, but it's taking a little bit of money, time, and energy to really get this, uh, this rocket ship off the ground. Or you're number three, you, you're in control. You're putting some systems and processes in place so it's not all dependent on you all the time. Four, you're into prosperity. So you have some systems and processes in place. And now you're looking at how do I scale this? How do I replicate it? How do I uh, make the most return out of this? Or number five, you're at this place where you have this financial freedom already and the business is running without you and you can go and do whatever you want, whenever you want. So, all right, so some ones, some twos, some fours, some threes, okay. A uh, bit of chaos, okay. Ones, twos, threes. Okay, great. Hey, look, this is really great for me to see because it will help me understand uh, what to what to share with you and which bits to skip over in the presentation. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, that's a really great mix uh, in here. Now, I completely get that on the journey of business, we may go up and down these, and particularly over the last couple of years, it's been a, a shaky ride with the whole COVID situation, and that would have put some of you uh, maybe up or down in these numbers as well. Now, one of the uh, things that I like to share with, with um, the business owners I talk to is this scorecard, which is really going to help us just get a very quick assessment on where you are now and where you could be. What are the, the gaps? If we can identify these gaps, to a four or five uh, sooner. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share this one with you. And um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share it with you actually at the end because I know what happens when I give people this link. They're so excited to, uh, to do it. They end up doing it during the presentation. So I'm gonna give you this link at the end and it's gonna give you, it will take two or three minutes and you're gonna get this really clear assessment on you know, where you are. Because what, what I find is there are a lot of business owners who make a lot of revenue, but really they're broke. There was a business I reviewed the other day, they were doing nine figures but they were losing money every year, right? They were going backwards every year. So what I think is most important isn't how much revenue we're generating, but is how much profit we're making. And so this thing is going to help us identify how do we turn your uh, business into the, the profit maximizing machine. And my promise for you on today's call then is to help you find an extra 100K in profit without extra time, effort, or risk. And I'm confident that we can do that with you. Um, because I, I do this all the time. I have sessions with people. I got to meet, uh, Chris very kindly introduced me to Paolo recently. And he said he had a 45 minute meeting to identify 100K and we did that. And so he, he really gets value and a lot of business owners I do. I have this ability because I've seen so many businesses now and I can see what works and what doesn't work to very incisively cut through and see like here's where the profit opportunity is. The other reason I'm confident in that is because a lot of the, uh, the business owners I, I get around, I see they have leaks in their buckets. Um, it's kind of like a blind spot. I think when you're busy working in your business and you're so focused on the business, you, you can't actually see the other bits. So it's kind of like if someone holds a mirror up and then you can see the bits that you couldn't see before, the angle you couldn't see. So I see these leaks uh, all of the time. And so what I'm going to do uh, is help you to, to begin to plug these holes. Now, because there's only an hour for us to go through on this call today, there's so much I want to give you and I'm not going to get through it all. So what I'd like to do is with my compliments, I'm going to gift you a copy of my, uh, my free report. And I'm just going to paste it here in the chat box right now. You don't need to opt in or anything like that. This report is probably some of the best thinking um, that I've picked up over the last two decades around how do we maximize the profitability. So it's taken a lot of time, a lot of money to put this resource together. But just please, yeah, take it, use it, read it. You don't need to opt in or anything. That's, that's just for you because... I'm not going to get through everything today. So let's jump in now and start talking about what I um, what I do have time to go through. So if I was to summarize these 125 free and easy to implement money maximizing opportunities that are in the book, then there are seven major profit leaks that are happening in the business. Oops. Somehow I just, there you go. There are seven different leaks that are happening in the business. Number one is we're not attracting enough qualified new leads. Right. That's number one. We're not getting and I say qualified leads. Sometimes we can get leads, but they're not the right kind of people. So we've got to attract the right qualified kind of leads. And if we do that well, number two is if we get those leads 
Are we converting them effectively into clients? I see too many business owners getting these leads and then actually not doing an effective job at turning them into clients because their sales process isn't, uh, isn't dialed in the way that it could be. Number three is we're not maximizing the average spend. So when these clients come on board, we're maybe giving them a small offering rather than helping them to uh, spend more money or invest more money with our products and our services. Number four is we're not getting them to buy frequently enough. Some people will come and buy from you once and never again. Some people will come and, you know, they could be buying from you every month or every week and they seem to buy sporadically. So are we getting them to purchase as frequently as they should? Number five is we're not managing our expenses effectively. I know some of you are very uh, focused and diligent on your costs and manage your costs. But every time I say to a business owner about, hey, you know, can we manage these costs uh, more tightly or more effectively? The answer is always no, but when we roll up our sleeves and look at it in detail, there's normally some opportunity in there to, uh, to get better uh, return or bang for a buck in terms of our expenses. The sixth place where businesses leak money is not managing time effectively. I don't know if you ever had that experience where you get to the end of the day and you wonder, what, do you do? what did you do? What was that all about? Um, or you get to the end of the day and it's, uh, it's super late. So are we using our time effectively? And for those of you with team, are the team using their time effectively? I think that can be a, a big um, killer of your profitability if the team aren't delivering what they need to do in the time that they need to. And the number seven is not managing cash effectively. Now, the more we can put our cash to work for us, the more we can turn those, uh, you know, those dollars into more dollars. So if we're, if we're keeping our cash tied up in places that aren't uh, yielding a return for us, that's the other big leak. So these are the seven big leaks, and I'm going to get through as many of them as I can in the time that we have on the call. And the question on that is like, where do we start? Where out of all of those seven, which one is the lowest hanging fruit, which is the best place for us to go to? Now, my mentor said to me, the best place to start with any of these things is to start by hiring an expert. And the very first item on this list was in terms of generating more leads. Now, those of you already working with Basic Bananas, great. You've got uh, the best resource uh, in the country and on the planet to help you generate more leads. And I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that we go there and we start this conversation today with getting more leads. One, because Basic Bananas are, are already doing that with you. But number two, more importantly, I think there's some more low-hanging fruit. I would think for many of you, uh, maybe even all of you, but many of you, you have enough leads. And where the opportunity is, is to absolutely maximize the revenue, uh, not the revenue maximum, the revenue and the profitability of your existing leads. So I want to focus more so on how do we take the leads that you have got and really get the most out of them or serve them at the most at the highest level. So the first place I want to start is conversion. Now, if I looked at your conversion process, okay, I'd imagine for many of you, you are missing opportunities to convert people. You're probably converting less than you would like or you should, or you may be, if you are good at converting, you may be not converting them at a high enough price or maybe, uh, maybe not, not quick enough. Sometimes the sales process takes too long or too much energy. So the first question I'd like to ask of you is, what is your current conversion percentage? So anytime you get a lead, say you get 10 leads, how many of those would convert into, uh, you know, into being a client? So at the moment, I wonder if you could just type in the chat box, roughly what percentage of the sales conversations do you have convert into clients. And if you don't know, that's completely fine. Just type in DK, don't know. Yeah, don't know. And I like the honesty. So we've got a mixture here then. So one and a half percent, 21 percent, 25 percent, 2 percent. OK, don't know. 30 percent, 2 percent, 5, 20. OK. Uh, oh, Camille, you have two businesses. So 60 percent and zero percent. OK. Tina, absolute machine, 80%. That's, uh, that's a pretty good result there, Tina. Now, this is, this is the very reason I don't always suggest that we start with leads because let's just imagine some of us down here have, what, 5 10 15% conversion. Uh, let's just say those who have, say, 10% conversion, that means we've got to get 10 leads through the door just to convert one of them. Now, if we could focus on increasing that conversion first, then that means every lead that we put through, we're, we're going to get more return from it. So conversion is going to be a very important place for us then, uh, with the exception of Tina. Tina, with 80% conversion, we may need to have a conversation around your prices. Maybe there's some, uh, some opportunity for us to push your prices up. And I don't mind then even if the conversion drops a little bit and you're making more money from that. But we can talk about that a little bit later in the next slide. I want to talk through with you an example of this then. So I was working with a kitchen store, a guy based out of Brisbane. 
And I looked at his conversion process and he was the same as some of you. He didn't know his conversion percentage to begin with. And so we went through a bit of a process and we, we got him to identify, first of all, what was his conversion process. Now, he was surprised because his team were converting roughly 15 to 20% of the leads, okay, that he went out to. And as, as he'd been the owner for 30 years, I asked him what his conversion was. And he said, if he went out to do the course, he would get 80%. So he would get 80% his team were getting you know, 15 to 20%. So a uh, massive difference there, a massive discrepancy. So we went through a, a checklist of 24 different items in terms of his sales process. And we identified many things that we could work on. But first of all, we really honed in on his sales script. So we helped him create you know, more desire and urgency. There was a sense of urgency that those people wanted to make a decision and work with him now, as opposed to if you've ever had the situation I'll wait a week, a month, a year, I'll come back to you later, send me a report, those kind of things. So do, do you have a dialed in sales script right now that really helps uh, you create desire or urgency? Or those of you online, do you have a really dialed in checkout process so that creates the, uh, the urgency that people wanna buy now? Um, for him particularly, his team, we saw a massive jump in terms of teaching some very, uh, very straightforward rapport and connection techniques. His team weren't really getting the rapport and the engagement with customers and they weren't getting them emotionally connected and emotionally engaged. So are you getting your customers uh, or your prospects emotionally engaged and using the right level of rapport to, to make them feel connected to you and want to buy? Um, great. And Sandy, awesome. You've got a script to remind you of the points during the call. That's wonderful. Does that script, does that script create a bit of desire and a bit of urgency? I think that's that's the important piece. How do we get people to want to feel compelled? Like I need this now. I have to have this now. The third piece that we identified with this, um, you know, uh, kitchen installer was a risk reversal, a guarantee. There was a concern in the industry, particularly for him. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the specifics that you know there were kitchen installers who would go broke, right? And there were kitchen installers who would say they were doing it a certain period of time and they couldn't do it in time. So we reversed that risk. He put a guarantee in place. Knowing that he'd been there for 30 years, he was, you know, guaranteed to, to be going on. But more importantly, he was guaranteed that he would deliver the kitchen and have it installed at the time they agreed. Otherwise, there was uh, a refund of some kind. Now, that helped reverse the risk and the guarantee. Now, with him, as I say, we went through 24 items and we identified these three. And what was the impact? Over a six-month period, he went from a 20%, a little bit less than 20% conversion to a 40%. So we doubled his business just by working on how to focus on the conversion. Now, when I see in this list, some of us having 5%, 10%, 20% conversion, those numbers down now, 30% conversion, uh, it, it becomes very possible to do that. Now, if we can get to double, that's highly likely um, or dependent on your business and the specifics of your business. If we can push that up more, then I think that's, you know, there's a big opportunity there. So I have a question for you. What would it be worth uh, to your business if you doubled your conversion. And you don't necessarily need to write that in the chat box, but have a think about it. What would it be worth if we could eat up your conversion that way? Now, I don't know the specifics of each of your businesses. Would it be the three things that we've identified for him or would it be some other things um, we would need to, to check through that checklist and identify what those are for you? So what would it be worth to double the conversion in your business? Now, here's another example then of uh, an awesome member that I work with. We got focused on what were the highest margin products and services? Because it's one thing to make the sale, but it's another thing if we can make the sale of an item that's going to deliver you more profitability. So I worked with this jeweler, and one of the things that they had, they were selling a lot of diamonds, but they equally had ranges of other stones. And we identified that, I think it was the sapphires. The sapphires were worth significantly more in terms of profit margin. The customer may end up spending the same, but they would get an amazing product, and it would be worth more margin to the jeweler. So we got clear on that and in the sales process, we just started uh, structuring that. So we position the right products and the right service. So do, do you think, are you aware of which of your products or services are more valuable, which ones we should be positioning more? For them, what actually happened is it, it drove a 52% increase in gross profit, but more exciting than that, um, when we make changes to the gross profitability, but don't make any changes to the overheads in the business, even more drops through to the bottom line. OK, so they had a 152 percent increase in profitability overall. Uh, now, what that meant and here's the here's why I love profit so much and focusing on profit. They hit their six month uh, uh, three year target in six months. It changed their business because they could bring in a new uh, jeweler. So it freed up the jeweler to, uh, you know, who was the owner to go and do other things. They at home, they managed to bring in someone to help uh, with a bit of cleaning and a bit of cooking uh, to, to make the home life easier. And it gave them time. They can actually have holiday time away and be with their, uh, you know, their family and not have to worry about the business. So 
The other thing around conversion then, I, I just want to ask, do you know how to position the most profitable products during your conversion process? And if you could position your more profitable stuff and now you know, what difference is that going to make to you? How is that going to help uh, increase? Now, here's a question I'd like to ask of you then, which is you've identified what your conversion process is right now. What would you like your conversion to be? What, what would you target? So if you're currently at, say, 1.5% or 3% or 20%, are you happy with that? Or would you like a higher number? Just, just write down in here, let's set an intention on today's call. What would you like your conversion percentage to be? Have I lost everyone? Oh, no, here he is. It's coming through. I just thought you all went shy me for a second. Yes, 100% conversion would be great. That's a nirvana, isn't it? I think that's, that's good. There are certain businesses that get that consistently and um, you know, we can go into drug dealing or something like that and they have a pretty high, high conversion in there. Uh, but 80%, 100%, yeah, great, 60. Now, the important piece is, is that we set that intention and we work towards that. Um, consistently, it's, it's possible depending on your industry and how we frame the, you know, the conversation and the quality of the clients that we get up there. Uh, yeah, so uh, Alex, I think that's great. Stage it, aim for 40 and then, and then go from there. Now, for all of you then, you've identified what you have right now and what you want, just get clear, what would that be worth to you? Because if we focus in purely just on this one metric, not even on all the other metrics that I've talked about, if we focus in on this one and make this our focus to, to just really nail this conversion process, it can make the biggest difference. We wouldn't need to get you any more leads, you keep the same number of leads that you have right now, but we just increase more of those coming through. And then and that, that will really uh, make the biggest difference. So, okay, just make a mental note to yourself. What would that be worth to you? How would that change your business? For many of you, I can see that you picked like to double that number. So your, your business would double. Okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath there and we are gonna go into average dollar sale. So once we've created that client and that client uh, comes on board, the question is, well, how do we serve them in such a way that they spend more with us each time. So each time they spend with us, they, they, you know, there's, there's a higher value, okay? And from the perspective of just serving them and maximizing the service, I, I want my clients to spend as much as possible with me every time because that means I can give them more service and more value and support them on, on more of their journey. So uh, are you maximizing the average spend of each client? If you just sat and thought about that, do you feel as though you're, you're really squeezing the juice out of every single one or are we missing opportunities? Um, now, here's a question for you. Uh, do you know what your average dollar sale is, right? Do you actually know what it is? If you know what it is and you want to share it, you're welcome to. Or if you know what it is, you can just type yes in the chat box. And if you don't know what your average dollar sale is, there's, there's no shame in that. Just say no, because then it tells us what we can work on. Okay, great. Okay, so some of us are specific. So 180, 399, 320, 180 to 200. Some of us aren't aware yet, and that's fine. We're probably going to get some assignments to work out well, what is the average dollar sale? Because uh, once we, the saying is what we focus on expands. So if we know that the number is 180 and we focus on how do we make that 200 or 220, well, sure enough, we're going to take the actions to make it expand. So if we don't know, great. That's an awesome opportunity. We're going to identify what it is. And, uh, and then we're going, to, we're going to start being strategic about how do we push that up. Um, Camille, awesome. You've got a, uh, a really decent... Uh, average dollar sell there and I wonder can we uh, can we increase that um, Shane thank you for your honesty currently not maximizing it at the moment um, and, and uh, yeah of course as consultants it, it can vary significantly depending on the client and the scope of work etc uh, okay so now talking about that this is another company that's um, you know IT consultant IT provider and it was an Atlassian specialist we reviewed like 15 different strategies uh, in his business around average dollar sell and what happened is we had him start making bigger offers from the start and pre-framing the clients with a bit of a roadmap. Here's, here's what's going to come. Here's the whole journey we can take you on. Now, painting that whole journey up front, it helped them kind of lock in this bigger vision of where we were going and it actually helped us make a higher uh, purchase at the beginning part of the journey. So they're buying a higher purchase, but they are already psychologically locked in. So just because we we're making a bigger ask up front and presenting a bigger service up front, the average dollar sale increased from the get-go. Um, I wanna share another example with you on that. Uh, when I worked in a large coaching firm, uh, they used to offer uh, at the start of the program, a three-month coaching package, a six-month coaching package, and a 12-month coaching package. Out of the options of three months, six months, and 12 months, which, which one do you think was the most purchased? Three months, six months, or 12 months? Just take a guess in the chat box. Three, six, or 12. 
Okay. A good range of guesses. The most purchased was the six month. It was kind of in the middle. It was framed that way. Some people would take the 12, some people would take the three, but most were six months. So to increase the average dollar sale, that first sale, what was the smart thing to do? We took away the three month option and instead we put in a six month package, a 12 month package and an 18 month package. Which one do you think became the most purchased? Six, 12 or 18? 12, that's right, exactly. Now, Margaret, there were a lot, a lot of people brought the 18 month package, but now how great is this? Because what it meant, if we sold a three month package, every three months, we'd have to be reselling that client. If we sold a six month package, every yeah, and things change. They don't always convert. It wouldn't always happen. But if we could help them make that bigger purchase up front, they were more engaged, more connected to the process. So they went from having an average uh, that the main one being purchased was six months to 12 months. So doubled the average dollar seller just by the positioning, what we we're positioning up front. So there's a bit of inspiration there. Um, I got slightly sidetracked on what I was talking about with this IT company. The other thing I did was demonstrate the return on investment. Being able to put something in front of your client or your prospect that helps them uh, really see the benefits. Now, in their case, it was demonstrating the return on investment. Their IT solution would help the company save, save time, significant time, which meant highly uh, productive, higher return, et cetera, for them. So if you have the ability to demonstrate a return with your product, then you know, let's make sure that we have that in there. Now, that's not relevant for all of you because I know you don't uh, sell products in that way, but uh, for some of you develop uh, the ROI. Now, for this IT company, that boosted their revenue one and a half times, but the profit went up you know, 8.9 times. So this average dollar sale can be a, a small area we can leverage and focus on that's going to have a big impact in terms of the profitability. Okay, here's another really important question for you. When was the last time you increased your prices? You can answer this in the chat box if you like. When was the last time you increased your prices? Yvonne, very recently. I see a few nevers in there. This week, congratulations, that's great. Always nice to give yourself a pay rise. So, okay, there's quite a few from this year, which is good. I don't always see that. A lot of people say a long time ago, five years ago. Yeah, Shauna, I see that five years ago. Um, okay, yesterday, never. Right, hey, I'm seeing a real, real mix here. For those of you who have put your price up recently, you know, great job. Um, and Shane, we are going to talk about that. You talk about discounting in a minute. I want to share some scary statistics with you around discounting. Uh, Joanna, this year after 20 years, congratulations. Uh, you just give yourself a round of applause. I think uh, after 20 years and you pulled, you know, pulled the pin on that and, and put them up, that's brilliant. Um, I was speaking to a former Genius Bunch member uh, this week and he runs an, an awesome business. And he said the same thing. Like I'd spoken to him about this topic maybe five years ago about price increases. And anyway, he hadn't, he'd felt that the market was too competitive, couldn't put his prices up. Anyway, um, in this last couple of months, he's gone from uh, equivalent of $60 an hour to $75 an hour, right? And so what are we talking about there? I think that's like a 20% or 25%, 25% increase. Um, no one complained, no one said a thing, right? It wasn't an issue. So he's kind of kicking himself he didn't do it sooner, but that makes a massive impact on his bottom line because all of a sudden you put your prices up without increasing your cost base, all of that drops through to the bottom line. So let's, let's talk through this and let's get you on, this, on the same page. For those of you who have already put your prices up, brilliant, you can pat yourself on the back when I share this with you. Those of you who haven't, I want you to take this as encouragement because it will help drop through to the bottom line. So this is a table, it's a mathematical table, okay? And what it does, is it shows you, dependent on your gross margin, if you put your prices up, how much less would you need to work? Okay, so let's just say you had a 30% gross margin business and you put your price up 5% across the board, you would have to work 14% less to make the same money, right? So in theory, you could put your price up 5%. If you lost 14% of your clients, you'd still be in the same financial position, but doing 14% less work, okay? And then if we pick another example, say you've got a 40% gross margin business, if we put your prices up, 10%, okay, you could lose 20% of your work and or do 20% less work and still be in the same position financially. Now, I don't, I don't tell you that so that you can drop work and, you know, do less work or lose clients. I tell you that just because sometimes that takes away the fear of like, what happens if I put my prices up and people leave or people don't, don't like it. Okay. Now, typically what happens for, for most people, depending on your business, and this is very industry specific, depending on your business, People put their prices up and when they do it in the right way, when they have the right scripts and the right process, the customers don't complain. They don't have a problem around it. 
Um, we, I, I'm thinking about this, uh, Krista, when we ran this in the uh, Genius Bunch, I know Neil was happy because he did this and he got a pay increase and could take an extra day off for a week with a lady with the um, Kids Play Center and she put a price up 20%. No one complained, no one said a thing and she wished she uh, did it sooner. We have one lady um, who is a coffee shop owner I said, Kevin, I can't put my prices up on the coffee because people are really sensitive to that. And I totally agree. Some products people are very sensitive to, but if they come in for the coffee and they keep that price the same, we could put up the acai bowl or the sandwiches or the toasties. Uh, those could get a price increase and the customers uh, in most cases won't, won't notice, won't have an issue. So if you haven't done a price increase recently, I'm going to encourage you to think about it. Uh, customers are probably expecting it with all this talk of inflationary and cost increases as well. So it could be a very appropriate time. Um, boom, boom, boom. So my question to you is, are your customers as price sensitive as you think? And it, maybe we need to work out for you if we put your price at 5% or 10%, what's that going to mean to your bottom line? Um, yeah, this, this, uh, this person I presented for, he was a physiotherapist and he put his prices up and basically he put his prices up but he didn't increase what he was paying uh, his team for delivery and they were okay with that and he said that delivered an extra 30 to 45k to his bottom line that one thing i was keen to ask him about you know did the customers have a problem with that he said, no one mentioned it okay so uh, i think i'm, I'm going to bang in my drum now i think you get the point on that one so um how much could a price increase at your bottom line? I'd like you to get an idea of that, maybe write that down on the paper for yourself. What, what could that do if we, we get your prices up? Now, if we speak about uh, discounting, I think someone, Shane, you said that you fall into the trap of discounting. Let's talk around that. I, I think we need to have a conversation around that because even if you don't put your prices up, if we can find a way to stop you from discounting, that's going to be worth significantly more to you because this works the opposite way. That little table I just showed you, if people start to decrease their prices, depending on the gross margin. If we had a 30% gross margin business and we did a 5% discount across the board, you would do 20% extra work to make the same money. 20% extra to make the same money, right? And I don't know about you, I don't want to do 20% extra work to make the same money. That sounds a bit, uh, a bit exhausting. And then another example, if you had a 40% gross margin business and you reduce your prices by 10%, you have to do 33% extra work. So I have three rules around discounting okay in business number one is don't discount number two is don't discount and in case you don't get a message number three is don't discount now uh, i'd love to go into some details about how do we avoid that um for the the time that we've got today i don't think we'll get the privilege to go into that but i'm happy to talk in a little bit more detail some of that really becomes around framing and positioning and there's a heap of things that we could do around that uh, i want to share with you an example of how one business owner dealt with this. I was in New York and I saw this sign up in the window saying $3 haircuts, why pay more? And I was like, I'm super intrigued. And there was a queue around the corner for this, right? $3 haircuts, I couldn't understand how they could do $3 haircuts. But anyway, they did, they had a big queue and it was hairdressers across the road and their hairdressing uh, costs were a similar price. I know typically $50 around there. And I said, man, what, what are you gonna do? Their prices are so low. Are you gonna reduce your prices to compete? And he said, no. Here's what I'm going to do. And he gets out a board and he writes on the board and he sticks it in the window. And the board says, we fix $3 haircuts, right? So the key thing about that is the positioning, right? He was positioning, look, they may be the low cost producer, but we're premium, we're quality. So something about how do we position ourselves and all of the great work uh, you do in Basic Bananas with positioning and branding can really help with that. So if you are discounting, let's find an alternative to discounting, okay? I'm going to keep pushing on with the average dollar sell and I just want to squeeze in as much as we can in the summer we've got. So do you price anchor? Now, I know this is a concept that gets shared in the basic finance community. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is, is one thing if we share the concept, but it's another thing to make sure it's implemented and are we implemented in uh, a lot of the clients that I work with. Um, with the coaching and implementation, we're really making sure we take the concepts that you've learned in the basic bananas program and really implement them. So do you have a price anchor and are you using it? And so for those of you, uh, if you're on the call and you're not familiar with a price anchor, the idea is that over time, um, people get more trust in you. So they're more likely to invest or spend more money with you. And so if we can set up a price anchor 
we can uh, set the frame of like, this is my biggest and my best thing. This is the best service I can get. And that could be very expensive. By comparison, all the products and services underneath look very uh, affordable in comparison. So psychologically, if you've ever studied any uh, anything around psychology, people will look at that and it's framed against the highest price. So it all almost seems better. One quick example for you, I was working with um, an artist and in his shop, his art pieces ranged anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000. And we just had the conversation. And so they ranged from two to 5,000. The average price was three to 4,000 that people would buy. So I asked him what was the most expensive uh, piece of artwork he could create. And he thought about it and he thought he could make some really massive piece worth 25,000. And he did, and he put that up in the, uh, in the gallery. And now what happened, I don't think anyone actually bought the $25,000 piece yet, but the average dollar sale went up massively because people were looking at the $25,000 piece. So they were more inclined to then start buying seven, $8,000 pieces. Okay, just because of that frame and that, that contrast there. So um, here's an example. This one's probably more so from the services industry. You may think of this. I, I mentioned, say, Tony Robbins before because I worked with him. He's a good example of a price anchor. If you, I don't know, you like the guy, or don't like the guy. He does this very well. He'll stand on stage and he'll say, it costs a million dollars a year to work uh, with me plus a percentage of your upside in your business. Now, does anyone ever pay a million dollars? I, I don't know. He takes celebrities and works with them, you know, and probably gets testimonials from them, right? But psychologically, there's a million dollar price point there. So when you're asked to work with one of his coaches on a, uh, you know, your six month, 12 month, 18 month package, you know, to pay 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, it seems very reasonable in comparison to the million dollars. So there's a big contrast frame. So if you are, if you're already using a price anchor in your business, okay, just type yes in the box. And if you're not yet, you don't yet have a price anchor in the business, type no. Okay, All right, Shane, and that's a great opportunity for you then from a discounting perspective. That's one immediate thing you can do to stop discounting. Because if people see that you have that higher price point, all of a sudden the price that you're charging, you don't need to reduce because you're comparing it to something higher. Uh, okay, all right, so yes, sort of, no, no, no. All right, there's a lot of no's here, so we really need to help you implement this. There's so much value in this. Um, one of the members uh, I worked with in the past in the Basic Bananas community uh, was a great example of this. She owned a cat hotel, and she did this awesome thing. I asked her, hey, if we do this price anchor, uh, how much, like, what's the biggest and best thing you could do? And she came up with something really lavish. Hey, when the, when the cats arrive, we're going to serve them a prawn on bone china. We're going to, you're going to be able to FaceTime your cat 24 seven, wherever you are in the world, you can call in to see them. We're going to give the cats massages and she decorated the rooms. Anyway, it was such a lavish thing. I said, how much is this going to cost? She said, well, if I'm going to do it, I have to charge $1,400 for all the people that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have here um, uh, for all of the, the staff. I need to be there 24 seven. And so sure enough, she did that. And we wrote a press release. So she put together a press release and it, it got picked up. Um, it went all across, I think, Fairfax, who ended up in a lot of magazines and publications. I think people were talking about on the radio about this crazy $1,400 a night. Now, did she sell a $1,400 a night uh, cat hotel accommodation? I, I don't believe so. I don't believe to this day that's ever happened, right? But did it increase her average room night from the typical, you know, uh, 30 to 40 and you know, push up? She sold more of those. So she sold more of that lower price item because people got aware of the bigger item. So there's a bit of fun to be had around that, the price anchor. One, one aspect is, um, you know, is to, to frame, frame that up and see the price comparison. But the other piece is, you know, there could be some good publicity around it, depending on what you're framing and what you're doing. Uh, Peter is asking a question. Do you advertise the anchor on your page? Um, yes, I have, but don't advertise. Hey, look, I, I think you can. There's a whole conversation here a little bit deeper around your business, I, I wouldn't necessarily put your prices up on your page, depending on your service, um, but potentially, you know, advertising, you have this amazing service or this extra thing or this bigger, bigger item. Yes, it, it, it really could help because then it, it frames just the contrast between the two. So uh, Peter, without knowing the context of your business, I think, yes, it could be a good idea, but let's, let's discuss that a little bit further. I'll stop on if we have time to do some Q and A's at the end and we can go into some specifics. Okay, average dollar sale. So how much value would a price anchor uh, you know, add to your profit if you implemented it? A lot of people say no, but what difference could that make? Just maybe make a note of that for yourself. And what difference could that make? All right, I'm going to pause on average dollar sale. So I think there's so many more we can go to. And I've given you a sprinkling of you know, some of the ones that I think you could implement immediately. Um, but there's, there's so many more on there. But let's jump into transactions just to say that we can get across all of these. So 
Um, before this call, I was uh, on a call with my clients in Ecuador, so they're IP lawyers, and uh, I've got a great example from them around the number of transactions. So the idea is if we bring on a client, we get them to spend more on each spend, and then we get them to spend more frequently. So how do we get them to, to have more transactions? If they buy from you once in a year, how do we get them to buy five times, 10 times, 20 times in a year? Now, that depends on their product or service. Um, Tina, as an example, say they come and stay, you know, at one of your apartments, you know, once a year, can we get them to come every quarter, right? And then all of a sudden that client is worth four times as much to you. Uh, so how do we do that? Now, one example I want to share with you is these IP lawyers I was talking about. They made more profit from January to March uh, than they did in the whole of 2021. Now, how did they do that? We went through 20 plus strategies uh, for them in terms of how to increase the number of transactions. And we identified them. One of them was really super simple and it made a big difference. It was automated reminders for renewals. They have significant amount of um, IP, I, I, IP, I don't even see, uh, IP certificates or IP, um, if anyone's a lawyer on here, help me out. They have significant amount of transactions that every year needs to be renewed. And they were relying on the team to do it manually. And sometimes the team would do it or they wouldn't do it well. Uh, so what we did is we got it automated. Now having the automated reminder system in place um, put into a system that just actually triggered more clients to get up to date, up to speed and not miss these things. So they got more of a conversion from this. So having like automated reminders in place is, uh, is a really good example from them. Um, the other thing is education. How well are you educating your clients on why they need to purchase more frequently? Um, one of my favorite examples around this is like carpet cleaning. When we moved into our house, we had the carpet cleaned. You know, uh, bought a new place and you know carpet needed cleaning before we moved in and I would have been happy one off one and done but the carpet cleaner was very smart they left this education around well what happens in your carpet is you know you get dust mites and these dust mites build up and that's what causes allergies and so uh, and the dust mites uh, I think they had some external data the dust mites uh, excrete etc and that's what causes health problems so really you need to be having your carpet cleaned every six months so sure enough, with that kind of education, all of a sudden a one-off purchase becomes every six months and they keep coming back again and again. Now, how long will they come back for? They could come back here for, you know, forever, as long as I own carpet, right? So they've gone from maybe a one-off thing to a regular recurring thing. So um, are we doing things with your clients to help them repurchase more frequently? Are we giving them education, either education from yourself or external data? That company in particular pointing to external data talking about the problem of health and health risks. Um, Here's another question for you. Do you have any kind of subscription or uh, monthly recurring revenue? Because this could be really valuable. Uh, I, a coaching company I was speaking with recently, I, they took me through a sales process and they really could have sold me into six months, 12 months or even longer, but they, they want to sell me into one or two sessions. Now, if they set up and say, hey, Kevin, you know, we could have a monthly uh, recurring thing here. I, I probably would have gone for it. Let's do a monthly recurring thing for six months or 12 months. Like I could have been sold on that, but they, they missed that trick. So um, Veronica, yes. Uh, the best thing we ever, ever did was set up renewing auto debits. Veronica, like high five to you. Thank you for, for sharing that. So Veronica set up renewing direct debits and then you don't need to chase people. So there, there's a, a added benefit to that, right? You're saving administrative time when people don't pay you and you've got to follow them up, follow them up. So auto renewing debits, brilliant, Veronica. You're just going to get a big high five for that share. Okay, All right. And transactions, where else do we go? There's a few more in here I want to share with you then. Um, and if uh, a colleague, a colleague, a client of mine I work with, he owns several F45 gyms and we did a reactivation campaign. So how many of you have past clients, okay, that used to buy from you and they're not, they're not buying from you right now? OK, how many of them um, could be buying from you again if you reactivated them or reminded them? So with this client, um, we identified that if we did some promotional text or emails, OK, or, or campaigns, then we would get clients back. And sure enough, we put on a challenge, promoted the challenge at a, a very valuable rate and activated. I think it was like 35 clients came back within the first week and a half, two weeks. Right now, that's a significant uh, return from a few texts and a few emails. So are the past clients we need to be thinking about that we can get back? Um, and here's one example, and this isn't from business, but I think we can borrow things from outside of business and bring them in. The Spanish, uh, I think it was the Spanish government, they were concerned that they weren't getting enough people being organ donors because people had to opt in to be an organ donor. So they changed the law or the rules 
so that everyone was going to be an organ donor unless they opted out. So of course their uptake grew massively. Um, and you'll see this, I think Apple are great at doing this. If I buy a, you know, a, a subscription or an app from them, uh, that app is gonna recharge me every year, right? I, you know, uh, it, by default, I don't need to go and say, yeah, I want that again. I don't want that auto renew. So it's only an opportunity for auto renew. Uh, Sandy, uh, you're worried about the additional workload. Yeah, okay, Sandy, I think that's, that's really important. And there's a psychological piece here that we need to be mindful of. We don't want to put you in a situation where there's too much workload and you can't handle it, but let's work out the business model here. Is there a way that we can get other people to deliver some of this work for you uh, in a way that's affordable? Or if you're going to get too much work, let's go back to this price conversation and we pump your prices up to a point where you, know, you can serve fewer people and uh, actually earn more money anyway. So there's a, a few conversations around there. All righty. Uh, what have we got? We've got 10 minutes. Uh, all right. I'm going to keep pushing through. I think we might be able to do this. There's still a lot uh, I want to share with you. Let's talk about number five then, expenses. Okay. So there are over 30 plus things that we can start looking at in your business to identify, you know, where are the opportunities here to, uh, you know, to, to keep the costs in alignment with what we want. Um, one of my favorite questions, and I think you can ask this, is to go for your P&L and ask, is this really necessary? Right. And the reason I've got a picture of these airplanes uh, on a carrier ship here is because uh, during the war, before airplanes had the ability to land on ships, like, they, they needed to work out a way, how do they get this airplane to land on a ship and take off from a ship? Now, of course, the problem with the ship is a very short runway. So back then, the airplanes were very heavy, and they had to identify how do we strip out all of the things that are not necessary? So they went for this plane, is this necessary? Passenger seat, don't need that. You know, these bolts don't need that. And they made the plane as light as possible so it could take off from the runway. So I want to ask you in your business, is this really necessary, right? If you go for your P&L and identify things, is it really necessary? Is it adding value to the client at the end? Um, I asked this from a transport company and they'd already gone for a management review and already gone for the P&L and they assured me they couldn't find anything else. But when we went through and asked, is this really necessary? They actually identified that they could automate something. You know, it was arrivals, you know, rather than having a physical person there at the arrivals um, sitting there all the time, they can actually have a, um, a kiosk check-in process, which the customers were happy with and they loved and it saved them over a million dollars. So even if you're thinking right now, yeah, I've got all that covered, I, I would encourage you to look again. Uh, Camille, I'm seeing you covering your eyes. I'm, I'm not sure what that's for. Did I say something wrong or was there, uh, just share with me if there's something uh, something I needed to do there. Uh, here's the other piece. Can we go through and renegotiate with existing suppliers? Okay, and I, just something simple every so often, getting three quotes you know, on a service that you buy. I know I had um, with one of my clients, he did this. He actually ended up staying with his existing supplier because he went and got two other competing quotes. He was able to go back to them and say, look, they're offering the same service. Uh, they're actually offering more service for the same money or they're offering um, you know, the same service for less money. And then he could have that conversation with his existing supplier and the existing supplier said, yeah, okay, there's some things we can do. Let's bring the price down and, um, and I'll keep serving you. So is there an opportunity to renegotiate as well? That can be a very important thing for us to, uh, to think about. So... Um, oh, Camille, you've got a list of unnecessary things. All right, so that, that is actually a good thing. You're covering your eyes, but if you look at that, then I think there's, there's immediate savings there and actually real, a real immediate cash impact for you. So uh, I think that could be a good opportunity for you to, today to, to go and take a look at that. Um, renegotiating three quotes. Okay, that's good. Yeah, renegotiate the three quotes. Um, for those of you who do, you know, you, do you look at your accounts on a monthly basis? Are you getting reports on a regular basis? And are you reviewing them against your targets? This one small thing, this seems very simple, but actually again and again, I, I've seen this be the very driver that changes businesses. Um, what you focus on expands. So if you're looking at P&L once a month uh, in comparison to where you want it to be, then you know what's going on. And Shauna, it's, it's okay if you don't, but then I think if you can put focus on that, then, uh, then it will really make a difference. Now, typically a lot of business owners um, wait until the end of the year when the accountant provides a tax return, okay? And by that point, we've missed a lot of opportunity to make tweaks and changes. So if you don't do that, let's see if we can find a way. Um, uh, oh, weekly, thanks to BB Magic Numbers. Okay, awesome, Sandy, that's, that's really great. If you're reviewing them weekly, then you are a rock star. You, are, you get 52 chances in the year to review those numbers and tweak things and change things. And that can take, you know, from a, a small change can make a big difference by the end of the year. So high five to you, Sandy. I need to update my slides, not monthly, weekly. Weekly is a new standard Sandy's setting. Uh, 
have you implemented profit first? Um, I'm not going to labor this one for too long. Um, there's a system that you can use to make sure you're allocating yourself profit and then allocating your tax aside and then managing your expenses afterward. This, the focus around this can become very valuable. We'll, um, I just want to make sure we talk through the others though. Time. So number six, time. We are uh, going to, Veronica loves profit first. That's great. Your bookkeeper hates it though. That's okay. Your bookkeeper's there to serve you. <laughs> Where are the profit first bookkeepers? Hey, there's a heap of them. Um, if you need a connection with, with someone, we can probably uh, probably find you. I think there's quite a few of them around. Um, now, if your bookkeeper hates it, it doesn't matter. What you're going to love is that you're allocating your profit to yourself first. So by the end of the year, there's more profit in your account and less is sneaked out of business in other ways. So let's talk uh, very quickly about time. I mean, there's over 15 plus productivity strategies that we can go through. Um, one of my favorites, I, I reviewed these 15 with uh, a client I had and she was a trophy maker. And what we identified was that she was spending a lot of time uh, doing low value, low skill things in her business that weren't really adding a return to her. And she wasn't spending enough time in the high skill, high fund area. So when we identified that, we found a way to outsource those low value tasks to other people, which free up half her time. And that meant she could put it into the high skill, high fund, which was actually sales and marketing. Her business doubled very, very quickly. Right. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I spoke to a former Genius Bunch member uh, this week as well. And they're in a situation with their business where they don't have enough team right now. So they're working crazy hours, 50, 60, 70, I think, I think it's 70 or 80 hours a week. And we went through this uh, activity and they, they found generally 30 hours that they could get off of their plate in the next week or two, right? 30 hours per week, right? Now they were doing excessive hours. So that gets them down to a little bit normal, uh, you know, a little bit more normality. But how about for you guys? Do you think there's some opportunity in where you're allocating your time right now? If we looked in detail about where you're allocating your time, could we get you to do more high value activities that are more fulfilling for you and find a way to outsource some of those other pieces? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. I don't know. It depends where you're at. So could we, if we saved you 10 to 20 hours per week, how would that change your life? I think that's one to think on. Okay. And then number seven, cash. Uh, do you know your working capital cycle in days? Now, if you don't know what that is or what that means, that's okay. That's a no. That means we need to do some work on this. Okay. So um, if we look at Amazon, Amazon are a great example. They have a, a positive working cash cycle. So what that means is they get paid from their customers. So they have all the money set in the bank, right? And then they don't need to pay their suppliers. Uh, they don't hold any stock. They need to pay their suppliers until 30, 40, 50 days later. Right. So then they have positive cash flow all the time. So they can grow their business rapidly because the cash is coming in before they have to pay it out. Now, that doesn't seem to work necessarily for a lot of, uh, a lot of the businesses that I, I check in and work with because typically they have to go and buy the stock and have the money of the stock. And then they sell it to their customer. And then the customer doesn't pay uh, until you know, 20, 30, 40 days later. Right. And, you know, so then they're out of that money for 30, 40, 50 days. So one of the important things that we can do in your business is if we can get that cash flow to be positive or a shorter working capital size, so you've got more cash in your business, you can reinvest it to generate return quicker. So if you don't know what your working capital cycle is in days, I think that's something valuable that would be very, very valuable for us to work out for you. And how much better would your business be if all of a sudden you can have positive cash flow get people paying in advance or paying early then then that can help now i appreciate some of you'll be thinking that can't work in your business or your model i've heard that again and again and i've gone into industries and, and found examples you know where it possibly is so uh okay all right so just to recap them we have uh, I've, I've gone through I'm, I'm amazed i've got there i didn't think i was gonna get there we've gone through all seven uh, of these profit leaks and I think in every one of those, there's some opportunity for all of us. So if you feel as though you have found some opportunity to make some additional profit out of these seven, just type a yes for me into the chat box. Okay, that's wonderful, wonderful. All yeses so far, that's great. Okay, lots of yeses. Wow, sure you have. Uh, Shauna, that's awesome. Um, Yes, and Camille, yeah, keen to read the ebook. The ebook is, is really worthwhile. It's a very short read, but it will be very, uh, very valuable for you. Now, I want to be mindful of the time because I think we scheduled for an hour. So I want to just quickly go through uh, a handful of other things if I can. Um, I'm going to skip through this one because we don't necessarily have the time to do it. What I was going to do is share a demonstration with you of what happens if we focus on, I've got six levers here. If we just focus on six levers and give them a 5% increase across the board, what happens to the numbers? 
just to be mindful of time, I won't go through this, but the, the, the message I was going to give you was a small increase. If we focus on these small areas and get a 5% increase in each of the areas, it can really compound. In this example that um, I'm sharing with you, we, we changed 5% in on leads, on conversion, on average dollar sale, on transactions, and in cost of sales and in expenses. We've got a 5% improvement in each of those. Now, in this business, it doubled. Right, it actually got a hundred thousand dollar increase in there. So, if we can focus in on that um, and just small tweaks and changes to each of these levers, it's going to make a massive difference at the other end. So, I'll, I'll cut that short. Now, I did promise you I would give you this scorecard. Um, here is the link for you. I'm going to paste that into the chat box. Um, it says optimistically. So, you grab a copy of that link from the chat box. If you go through that, that's going to give you the opportunity to just assess where, where are the gaps. We picked up on a handful of them in the call today, but this is gonna show you what you're doing well at the moment and where your other gaps are. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what your scores are. I think there's some great opportunities. So click that one, do that one after the call. And now I did mention at the beginning, um, I don't have a chance to go for everything in detail here and serve you know you everything or specifics on your business. But if you are interested in actually uh, wanting to focus on this in your business and optimize your business, maximize probability, uh, and to, you know, to, to help grow that, then uh, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, I, oops, I can click the link. There you go. I'm happy to share with you uh, the opportunity to, to go through this specifically with you into your business and find the opportunities. Now, I appreciate we've got 40 something attendees on here and I think a few people have recorded. So I, I may need to, to qualify that. I, I don't necessarily want to go and spend, uh, you know, another 40 plus hours uh, serving this. It, I, I think I'd like to qualify that. If you are in a position where you think, actually, I want to hone in on this and really improve my business, I would potentially uh, like some support um, in implementing these things, then I'd be happy to uh, to have a complimentary conversation with you. I think if we sit down and go through these things specifically for your business, we could definitely uh, identify you a you know 100k of profit opportunity in your business uh, for 45 minutes. So um, I will just I'll paste that link in the chat box. Or maybe I have Crystal could kindly share that uh, afterwards. I'm going to pause there. I know some of you may need to run because we're right on time, but um, I'd love for you if you're still here just to type in the chat box. What's the, I say the top three insights. What's the number one insight? If there's one key thing that you learned today that's going to be valuable for you that you can take away and use, what would that be? So just type in chat box. What's like the number one thing and the most important thing for you? Thank you, Sandy. I'm glad. Small changes can have big results. I'm yeah, don't miss kind of those links in there as well. The, um, the Calendly links in the chat. So those of you, um, you'll see a lot of comments coming in. So to grab the link, it is already in there and we can of course share it in a follow-up afterwards as well. Beautiful. Uh, you'll see it there. If you just scroll back, everyone on here, I'll keep the meeting open for a while longer so you can just scroll back. You'll see two from me. One was the um, uh, reposting the, the quiz one, the, the questionnaire, the checklist um, uh, that you posted, Kevin, and then also the Calendly link. Oh, you did. You posted that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't save it here to copy it. So that's great. Uh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. That's great. The, um, um, can I just say something too? The um, on on this one, the the call with with Kevin. Um, I've personally had calls with Kevin. Like a lot of the members have. You're you're getting a lot of value from this. But I'd also just say um, because this was something about this session, we were kind of looking going if you get, you know, there's going to be a lot, like there's a lot of people and there's a lot afterwards. And so as Kevin touched on, usually Kevin's qualifier is someone's doing a million dollars in revenue plus. Um, and what we said is let's, let's pull it down to make it available because obviously there's a lot of, in the basic bananas community, a lot of keen people that you might only be doing a hundred grand a year, but you know, if you can turn it into more profit, you can have a very good lifestyle at, you know, if, $200,000 business and whether it's, you know, there's plenty of $10 million businesses we work with that don't make as much as someone doing <laughs> profit as much. And, um, and so having Kevin to be available for you guys and we're like, what do you charge? You know, the, the fee would be sort of too high. So he's generous, gener very generously said, okay, it'll be, a, um, you know, a complimentary uh, that, that session. So once again, yeah, just to, just to reinforce the fact that, you know, you are keen to, uh, to make a goer because obviously respectful of um of Kevin's time as well and um 
and uh, you know, very appreciative of that offer. I think it's a super duper amazing offer. So I think it's like deserves an extra. Um, you could all do give a like thumbs up to your computer screen for Kevin, even though you can't see it. Let's just do it. So we know there's like a there's a lot of thumbs out there for you, Kevin, right now. Um, Thank so you. It's a very very <laughs> generous offer. So um, you know, and I think of course if you are in that situation, it's a no brainer. Awesome. Chris, I appreciate you saying that. And I, I, I think it's true. So um, I, I'm here of service. I, I love the basic bananas community and I want to serve and want to help uh, in any way I can. So if, uh, if you feel as it would be valuable for you, then please do uh, hit me up and, and let's jump on a call. I'd be happy to. Um, Christo, I don't know if everyone has to jump, if you have to jump, but uh, I'm happy to stay on and do some questions if there's any questions or anything like that. Or if you have to run, I, I'm completely cool as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm good for another about 10. I got to call a quarter past to jump on, but we're go, going good and check. So anyone, yeah, any questions, feel free to throw them in the box there. Thanks so much for all of the, the thank you messages. Um, Sandy, okay, Sandy has a question. So Sandy, I'm particularly interested in how to handle an anchor product when I don't advertise time for my six month program. Hey, Sandy, can you, can you unmute? Maybe let's have a quick conversation around that. Let's see if I can get a little bit of clarity on that one. Um, do we have the ability to unmute Sandy? Oh, give it a go. Allow to talk. You should be able to talk now, Sandy. Okay, Sandy. Hey, Sandy, please tell me a little bit more. What, what is it? What is your uh, service? Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Fabulous. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so I run a six-month coaching program for writers, um, and because it's a, a slightly higher ticker, ticket product, I don't advertise the price on my website. I get people on a call because it's really important that they're the right kind of people for that program. Perfect. Okay, that's good. Hey, look, and you don't necessarily need to put the dollar figure on your website. Um, in, your, in your call, in your conversation, we could, could we frame something bigger? Is there anything else you want to deliver beyond say the six month program? Now, I'm, I'm going to be, I don't know enough about your business, your background, but let's be creative here. It could be the case that you wanted to do a writer's retreat, right? And people were a membership of your community for a year and they could come on a retreat with you. They can have the six months writer's program. Uh, we could throw it in maybe, and I don't know what you do enough, but maybe you could throw in helping them publish their book or the marketing mm. book. So I'm just going to expand and expand, right? I'm going to come up with all these ideas and you can say, yeah, that works for me. That works. Now let's just say that it was the retreat idea that you liked. Now, maybe they get the retreat, they get the six month writing program, then they get some one-on-one -on -one support with you. Now, all of a sudden that becomes a very good uh, price anchor because if that was, you know, and I don't know your prices, but say that was $20,000 mm -hmm. uh, experience and your six month writing program is $10,000. Well, all of a sudden the $10,000 seems like very good value in yes. comparison to the 20,000. So I think that's the way to frame it. You don't necessarily need to put that on your website. That could be in a conversation. There's a company I've um, worked with uh, internationally and they do this very well. So when they pitch and present, they advertise a product or a service that's a $50,000 and or 50,000 euros. And then it goes all the way down to their, their initial price, which would be the equivalent of six months, down to like uh, 20,000. So then that price angle, does everyone buy the $50,000 product? No, more people go towards that middle range, you know, $25,000 in there. But the fact that the $50,000 is there, it brings up that value, that average value. Now, there are always people who want to just have the best. You know, they want to have the best product or the best service and they will buy the biggest thing that you have. So uh, I would have a think about what is it that you would like to deliver? Is there something, you know, uh, above and beyond this six-month program you'd be happy to deliver and you, you could offer up? Yeah, I've been doing lots of brainstorming. I just wasn't quite sure how to put it on there. Well, and then I think let's, uh, let's if you're part of the Basic Bananas community, I think yes. you should uh, work through that with Christo and the team because they are the experts at this and they will absolutely help you nail that one in completely. So that's Thank cool. Thank you. Uh, uh, April, have I missed a question? Brian, discounts, thoughts on offering a discounted price initially and then raise the base price incrementally for that client or discounting as a welcoming offer or offering a subscription to access a discounted price. Uh, okay, hey, look, there's a few things in there. I'm, I'm always keen to add more value or more perceived value as opposed to discounting. So the question I would have for you, Brian, is there anything else that you could bundle in or package in that makes the product seem significantly more valuable um, without actually costing you much more money. Uh, if we can go that route now, either you have something already in your products or services that you could bundle in, or could you find an alliance partner who's willing to gift you something and, and, and give you something around that? Um, I, I, I know uh, in the community, Chris Stone and the team talk a lot about alliance partnerships. Uh, there was a member there who had a gym and 
they went around to all the other um, related businesses, you know, the massage studio, the um, physiotherapist, the juice bar, and they got them all to give vouchers for free. So they got the vouchers for free, but, and they could give that as a client arrived and came into the community, they could give them this book of vouchers had a very high perceived value. The, the value of the voucher there was probably $500, right? It cost them nothing else. And they were happy to give that to their clients and their clients can go around. And so sometimes um, adding, increasing the perceived value either by your own stuff or other people's stuff could be a, a great opportunity as opposed to discounting. So Brian, I don't know if I fully answered your question, uh, but maybe you can answer. Now, Chris, so I know you've got to jump in any second. So maybe we'll squeeze in one more question. Uh, April, how do you deal with scarcity without discounting? I have an online course. Um, okay, well, scarcity could be time. Uh, I've had an online course, it was a coaching program. And they got me all excited about this program. And they said, it's only available until this date, right? And so of course, as the time got closer, right? I felt crunched. Like, if I don't buy it now, then I don't get it, right? I, I'm, I'm gonna miss out. So we could have some scarcity around there. Um, potentially, April, the other thing with your scarcity, you're doing an online course. Do you have any component of one-on-one -on -one time in there? Because that could be the other piece of scarcity. It's like, hey, you can get this course for this price up to this date. And for the first you know, number of people, I'm going to give an extra group training or an extra one-on-one -on -one program or something like that. So is there scarce, a genuine scarcity on your time or something of that nature? Um, now, Christo, I know you've got to jump for, uh, for your next call. So I think we've covered off the questions that I've seen. So uh, well, if, there, yeah, if there are other questions, we could, uh, you know, leave you to it. I'm sure they'll ask you questions all day. You'll be here, Kevin. I'm sure you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm sure we could we could keep you here all day with um questions I personally could um at the same time um you know there's a, a a lot we could ask but um I think so much value from today this has been huge and um what I'm just doing is messaging the team on my end with those links the ebook link um the I called it a quiz but the the questionnaire like health check kind of uh link the profit um check the that you said shared and also um your link for the for that session so uh the calendar awesome. link so uh, that's so that'll get emailed through to everyone if anyone's lost it in the chat i know there's a lot of comments so um uh, but those links are there in the chat but they'll disappear once we close the session off so we'll also send an email denise will email from our team that's brilliant well thank you all so much i really appreciate it today always always a pleasure so i look forward to uh, hopefully connecting with a few of you soon and we can get into the detail of, of your numbers and your business awesome